Welcome to another session of Lectures by Lil BZ. Today we're going to be talking about uh, Protestant Reformation. Okay, chapter 3.1. I'm um, going to be talking a lot about Martin Luther uh, and his reasons for breaking away from the Catholic Church. Uh, we'll also talk about Ulrich Zwingli and the Anabaptists. But before we do that, we're going to take a look at uh, some of the early criticisms uh, that people had regarding the Catholic Church. All right, so when we talk about that, um, we... What we have to understand is that Martin Luther was not the first of the critics we've talked about uh, in previous videos, previous chapters. We've talked about some of those early critics. Um, but the problem really comes to a head uh, in the middle of the, or at the beginning of the 16th century with the advent of the printing press. As more books uh, become widely available, uh, especially the Bible, people begin to understand that uh, some of the things that they're being taught in church, for example, uh, is not exactly what uh, reflective of scriptures. Um, and so what we are going to really, though, discuss, um, I mean, although Martin Luther had a lot of criticisms as far as practices within the uh, abuses uh, within the Catholic Church, he really had some fundamental um, differences with uh, the teachings. So the term we'll use to describe that is, is dogma. Um, and when we get to that, we're going to talk a lot about Luther's faith and, and how important that was in uh, attaining salvation. But uh, the one thing that we'll talk, or I guess one of the ways to describe the way that Catholics were practicing their faith at this time was uh, outward outward expressions of their faith. So they performed the seven sacraments. Uh, they venerated the saints. They venerated uh, relics. They went on pilgrimages. They attended um, processions that honored the saints. So there were a series of actions. But when we talk about faith, that element of piety was, was absent. Okay, and so um, what we see pictured here too, I think it draws your eye to it rather uh, quickly, is this skeleton or this skull rather that um, was uh, a various saint. And so this was something that would draw people to it and they would come to visit uh, in hopes of receiving God's grace. So the idea behind all those outward signs of their faith, whether it be receiving sacraments or visiting a uh, pilgrimage site or um, viewing a relic, was that they were receiving God's grace, and God's grace what is what is necessary to attain salvation. Okay, so um, that was something that was commonplace: the veneration of the relics, um, and kind of happening at the same time. Um, and, and this is something that we've also discussed. There was a desire, there was a need um, of spiritual uh, thirst that people were feeling as if the, the Catholic Church was really uh, neglecting. All right. And so their spiritual leadership was uh, focused elsewhere. And so we start to see lay people like Thomas Kempis. We talked about Catherine Siena. Um, and, and how they had this desire to have a very close relationship with God. And so that criticism is, is, is going to become. So as the criticism uh, becomes a little bit more vocal, uh, some of the other things to take into consideration is that the prestige of the Catholic Church had been damaged. Um, and so something that we discussed in the first chapter was the Babylonian captivity and the Great Schism. Um, they were more consumed with power than they were with uh, providing spiritual leadership. And so what this map shows is, um, you know, how the how the world or I guess Europe was divided uh, amongst who they pledged their loyalty to, whether it was the um, papacy in Avignon or the uh, papacy in Rome. OK. OK, so some of the other things that we want to talk about are the specific types of criticisms uh, that people had okay um, the one of the biggest ones was uh, clerical immorality okay so the uh, clergy members having to take 
uh, certain vows. Uh, another one was clerical ignorance, and then of course clerical corruption. But um, so clerical ignorance really kind of stems from the um, lack of education that was provided toward uh, medieval uh, clergy members. Okay, so priests uh, and monks, but most importantly priests not having a, a true education on um, the scriptures as well as a solid foundation in church dogma. Um, and th things like this were often uh, sort of poked fun at, um, whether, you know, with, with some of the more secular uh, literature. So we see that with the Decameron by Boccaccio and the Canterbury Tales by Geoffrey Chaucer that they were frequently poked fun at. Um, one of the things with regard to clerical corruption was this idea of um, pluralism. Okay, and so pluralism is how a uh, religious figure, a clergy member, an upper level church official. Okay, so the, the term ecclesiastical posts or position refers to that of uh, bishops and in I would probably imagine even cardinals. So the church being a hierarchy, one of the things that you must understand is at the top, there's the Pope, beneath them are uh, a number of cardinals, and then below that you have what are called archbishops, but also bishops as well, and then below that priests, and it gets all the way down to the lay people. But those upper level positions, those ecclesiastical positions were often bought and sold, and sometimes um, the term plural, as the term pluralism suggests, you had people who held multiple offices. And so if you're holding multiple offices, it's impossible for you to do your work effectively. Not to mention many of these positions were bought and sold to lay people. And so they were people who were not technically spiritually qualified to even hold these positions. And worse yet, in some instances, some didn't even show up. Uh, or they didn't act, per function, perform the functions of that office. So that's referred to as absenteeism. Okay, so there's a lot of a lot of problems, a lot of issues with that. And so the bishop, for example, he is responsible for kind of overseeing a, a specific area. It's known as a diocese. And in that diocese are a number of parishes or churches and his responsibility is to visit each one of his parishes, each one of his churches, and make sure and talk to people, but make sure that the priests are performing their duties and they're performing their duties correctly. Um, he's also responsible for making sure that each one of his dioceses has a seminary. And a seminary is a place you know, that provides education for your clergy members. And so when we have the issue of absenteeism, when we have the issue of pluralism, that, that that's not happening, okay? And so then we start to see clerical ignorance and clerical immorality. I think it all stems from the top, all right? Um, so what we start to see <laughs> kind of at the same time as well is anti-clericalism, sort of a hatred for members of the cloth. Now, you know, when I talk about all these abuses, I mean, they may, they may have been widespread, but I, I have no information as far as how many. Um, but, you know, th there were plenty of devout priests and clergy members that did, um, you know, everything that was expected of them. And they, they sort of performed their functions with, you know, with distinction and with, you know, uh, with honor, if you would, if you will. Uh, but it, it is important to note that there was um, a lot of corruption, but that did, doesn't mean that it was um, all-encompassing. All right, so the um, church had to deal with this anti-clericalism. People, you know, angry, upset because of the breaking of the vows, but they were also sort of upset because they saw the church as privileged that they didn't have to pay taxes, they didn't have to serve in the military, they were exempt from a lot of civic responsibilities uh, that lay people were, okay? And so this is something that um, led people, um, you know, to dislike the church. The um, criticisms don't stop there. So eventually the criticisms begin 
um, to go all the way into church dogma, all right? So the things that they believe, the things that the Catholic Church believes. And we've already discussed Mark Siglio Padua, John Huss, John Wycliffe, and how these men sort of didn't really understand where a lot of these um, positions or, or teachings comes from because they, they don't see a lot of strong scriptural support for, for many of the things that the Catholic Church is doing. So the biggest thing that's going to you know come to a head is how salvation is uh, attained. The, the Catholic Church treats it as uh, something that can be earned, okay? That if you perform the seven sacraments, if you do good works, if you perform good works, um, then, you know, if you, if you perform the seven sacraments regularly, and the ones, the two that can be performed regularly are um, confession um, and then Eucharist, receiving communion. So if you do those two things regularly, you're receiving God's grace. If you do good works, then as far as the church is concerned, you're going to heaven, Okay. And the church here is the sort of intermediary between God and the lay people. It's the priest's job to make sure that, you know, his uh, followers, uh, parishioners are receiving the um, sacraments. And so he's sort of in charge of their salvation. But one of the things that's missing from this whole equation is faith, is the question of faith. So the way it seems is if the church is the way it's teaching, that if you perform all of these activities, that you're going to go to heaven. But you may not even believe or recognize that Jesus is your personal Lord and Savior. And so that's, that's what critics are, are beginning to question. And so they're, they're left sort of thirsting for more. Okay. Um, and so this is, you know, uh, groups known as the Lollards, the Hussites, even the brethren of the common life. There are all these groups around that are kind of looking for more, looking for a better explanation, a better uh, way to feel a connection to God, because that's what's, what was desired by, by most, if not all people. All right. Um, so one of the other things, too, that sort of uh, causes people to call into question church dogma is this concept known as purgatory. And purgatory is something that doesn't come around until about the 1100s, okay? Um, and it's this idea that, you know, if your soul is not properly prepared to enter into the kingdom of heaven, then you have to sort of purify your soul in purgatory. And um, the way it is explained that it's a place of suffering and for you to do penance. And so one of the sacraments, uh, confession, uh, you, you go to have your sins forgiven, you go to the priest, you confess your sins, and then he's supposed to have the power to forgive them. But then he also gives you something called uh, penance. And the idea behind penance is that's how you sort of remove the stain of the sin from your soul. And if you don't perform that, now the priest has a lot of latitude in what he grants, um, you know, or what, what type of um, uh, penance he issues. But typically it's, it's prayer, it's good works, um, which would include money, uh, things like that. And the notion is that if you don't perform that penance, then when you die, your soul will enter into purgatory to sort of pay off those good deed, I mean, those, uh, those sins kind of work that stuff off of your soul. And so a lot of people thought that that didn't really uh, make a whole lot of sense. So we get into Martin Luther. Um, he is, you know, one of the most significant figures in uh, Western uh, European history. Um, and it's, it's because he, he destroys the Catholic Church's uh, monopoly on faith, on religion uh, in Europe. And uh, he makes it comes up with a viable alternative. But that's not what he sets out to do. Uh, he sets out, he's a very faithful man. He becomes a monk, um, and then he becomes a priest. He also becomes a theologian because it's recognized that he has tremendous gifts 
and that he's you know very intelligent but he is a person who wants nothing more to, than to um, you know, practice his religion openly um, but when he finds that the church is corrupt he wants to clean it up so he starts out as a reformer but when he's excommunicated from the church he really has no option but to um, you know start another religion and so this is where things start getting interesting okay so you know the the i guess the myth behind all of this how he gets to start he was actually attending university his father wanted him to be a lawyer and then he was riding home and he got caught in a terrible storm or whether he was on his way home or returning back to to university he got caught in a terrible storm and he thought he was going to die and he made a deal with God that if, if he was saved, he would devote his life to Christ and he would become a monk. And so that's what he does. He enters the order of the Augustinian monks. Um, and one of the things that is of concern for Luther is the, this idea of assurance of salvation. I mean, he's not alone. Many people are preoccupied with the, with the idea of, you know, where are they going to end up? Are they going to end up in heaven or are they going to end up in hell? And, you know, at going back to the, you know, earlier slides, it talks about this very mechanical view of salvation. And I say that because, you know, uh, you just perform a variety of uh, tasks. And then if there, you succeed at completing those tasks, you're guaranteed your salvation. And that was something that did not make his heart... Um, rest easy. He was a, a man that was very conflicted. Some even say that he was depressed, uh, but it was mostly a, around that concept that he didn't necessarily look at God as a loving God. He looked at God as this, um, you know, punisher and that it, he was just simply waiting for, you know, Luther thought that God was waiting for him and others just to mess up so that he could come in and smite them and uh, damn them eternally and that was something that was very frightful and it was hard for him to love a god like that and uh, luckily or fortunately for him he receives his doctorate degree in you know uh, scriptures and church dogma um, the other term for that he becomes an expert on what's called canon law um, and so through his teachings and his further study of scriptures he comes um, across uh, the writings of Paul of Tarsus in the, Rome, in the, in the book of Romans, um, and, it, and, and it is sort of an epiphany for him. It's this uh, spiritual awakening, and it, it is something that relieved his soul or his heart from the great amount of suffering that he was enduring. And it's, it's a very simple passage that he comes across. But it's this idea that you are you are saved um, by God's grace, and that if you have faith in you know, so your faith justifies you, your faith saves you. And what is it that you need to have faith in? It's not simply just believing in God. It's believing that God so loved the world that He sent His only Son, and that His Son had to die for the sins of mankind in order for us to be saved. Uh, the message is, you know, pretty much that. That's pretty much it. The only other thing that I would add to it is that you, you know, are are to love God as you love yourself and or love God with your whole heart, mind, and soul, and then love uh, your neighbor as you love yourself. So these are New Testament um teachings and it's rather simple and um, that's the way Luther views it he thinks that the Catholic Church and salvation has been way has become way too complicated and it's unnecessarily so and that the Bible is um, not full of tremendous mystery because the church at that time really um, uh, warned people against reading the Bible that it was their job it was the function of the church to um, you know, interpret scriptures for them. Um, to be fair, there are some complex meanings in some of the uh, writings, especially in the Old Testament. And so, you know, is, is it all to be taken literally, or is some of it open for interpretation?
that's not anything that I'm attempting to convince you one way or the other of, but that is an argument. Some people take the church, or excuse me, take the Bible literally. Others view that there's a tremendous amount of symbolism within the scriptures and that, you know, that, that it's open to interpretation. But uh, Luther said, for the most part, it's something that we can all understand. It's, it's readable. And so that's what we should do. Um, we should be able to read the Bible and sort of make sense of it ourselves. And that's um, what he really pushes for. Okay. So it's this simple notion of, of faith. So that, that is really um, the, the practice or the, um, the idea of salvation that is uh, super important. Okay. So um, what else can we say? All right. So that, that idea that justification by grace, by grace through faith alone is known as sola fide. That's Latin. The other um, is, you know, how you develop your faith. And so to Luther, in order to develop your faith, to further develop your faith, you need to read scriptures. And that that's the only real way, um, you know, reflect reading the Bible and reflection upon it in prayer. Uh, that will help strengthen your faith. And that is known as sola scriptura. So it's sola fide, uh, by faith alone. And then sola scriptura is uh, by uh, scripture alone. And then he goes on and begins, this is where his work becomes much more radical. His teachings become much more radical when he comes up with this notion of a priesthood of all believers. And what that means simply, and that's also the sola gratia, that we're all equal in the eyes of God spiritually. Now, the Catholic Church uh, set clergy members uh, higher spiritually. They were on a higher spiritual plane than were lay people. So entering the, you know, taking the sacrament of holy orders was something that sort of puts you ahead of everybody else as far as God's grace is concerned. And, you know, two, two sacraments that a priest has to be able to perform because he's performing a miracle is the sacrament of Eucharist. Um, because according to the Catholic Church, Eucharist is, I mean, this is, this is the high point of a Catholic Mass. It's, this is the thing that uh, really it differs with uh, other Christian faiths, other, you know, what we'll just refer to as Protestants. But according to Catholics, the Mass is all centered around the Eucharist. And it's um, at that time that the priest stands at the altar and he performs, um, you know, a ritualistic ceremony and he re reenacts the Last Supper uh, that Jesus had with his 12 disciples. And, you know, the church maintains that there is sufficient um, scriptural support. Um, I, th I would imagine the Protestants would argue that, yeah, but there's not enough scriptural support to reinforce to, to back up everything you say about the Eucharist and what everything that, that, that the church says, the Catholic church says, is that a miracle is performed, that the priest performs a miracle, and then he tra and that, that the, the very substance of the bread and the wine is, is, is changed into the real substance of Christ. So it's his body and his blood. Um, and so the you know, as I said, the Catholics would offer that there is scriptural support for that, but the Protestants would say, yeah, well, m maybe a little of that, but not, not the miracle part. And so Luther denied that priests had that. He said priests don't. They're, they're regular people just like everyone else. And so they're not, there's no spiritual hierarchy. We're all the same. So that's sort of liberating, you know, that we're, everybody's uh, equal. Everybody's equal in the eyes of God. Uh, and so that's important, and I, I think that's sort of like um, something that you might want to remember for the for the AP exam. That this is, you know, this is something that's unique. You know, this idea of equality. All right, spiritual equality. Um, what else do I want to say about that? Yeah. So the priest doesn't perform the miracle. The priest doesn't forgive you of your sins. That's something that you, you know, that's between you and God. If you're truly sorrowful, you can, um, you know. Be, re, be forgiven. Um, but the Catholic Church believes that, you know, you have to, you have to do the, you know, confession. And that, 
the whole idea also is is in, incumbent upon this idea that you're contrite. So you have to have a contrite heart. So if you're not sorrowful, then you know the the you know that ceremony doesn't make any sense. That ceremony doesn't achieve what you know forgiveness of sins. Okay, uh, moving on. So when we talk about the indulgence controversy we're talking about there's a little bit of a backstory that's required for you to understand it but um so the catholic church is in the process of rebuilding saint peter's basilica which is the seat of the catholic church and so some very prominent artists and architects are being paid to beautify and help build saint peter's basilica and that in order to pay for that there's some indulgences that are granted but there's another interesting reason for why indulgences were being granted and that is that so a german um, prince could receive a third um, office ecclesiastical office so he's offered the archbishopric of mainz and the man is Albert of Hohenzollern, okay? And in order for him to do that, he was going to have to pay for that office. He was going to have to pay the church for that office. So for him to come up with the money, he was going to have to take a loan from a, a banking, a northern banking family known as the Thuggers, okay? Um, and so you might be wondering why would a lay person uh, be granted this? Why would he want, why would an ordinary person want to be a bishop? Um, especially if that person wasn't particularly religious. Why would someone who's secular not, or why is somebody who's secular want to be a bishop? And the answer is the money that comes through. Because of the tithing, they're going to have tremendous access to money. And so this would be a way for uh the Archbishop of Mainz to enrich himself. And so it, he is offered permission to begin selling indulgences to kind of pay off that banking family. So the church agrees, the Pope, Pope Leo X, gives him the special permission, the special what's called dispensation to sell the indulgences. And so he hires a Dominican friar by the name of Johann Tetzel, and that's who's pictured here. And so Johann Tetzel goes throughout the Holy Roman Empire peddling these indulgences. And the indulgences are, when we go back to talking about confession and how you have to work off penance or spend time in purgatory, uh, purchasing an indulgence um, is the, um, like, you do that in lieu of. So you purchase an, a, an indulgence so you don't have to perform the penance and also or or so that you don't have to serve time for your sins in purgatory. Now, you know, hear me out. The indulgence was the biggest form of corruption the church got involved in. But initially, the argument, the argument could be made that it was legitimate, that it wasn't corrupt because you had to be sorry in order to receive a indulgence you had to be sorry and you already according to catholic dogma you already have to do your penance right and part of your penance is to make you know alms um donate some alms to the church that's money so in essence by buying an indulgence you're doing just that you're making a donation to the church and and that's not necessarily bad because the church uh, as all churches do do a lot of charitable goods they do a lot of charitable things to help people so it's not initially it wasn't that big of a deal but over time they started selling indulgences for people when they didn't even ask about how contrite their heart was that that wasn't a prerequisite prerequisite you didn't have to be sorry um, and then it got absurd because you could sell indulgences for sins, not just the sins you've already committed, but the sins that you uh, have yet committed. 
So your future sins can already be uh, forgiven in a way. And so that seems like pretty absurd because um, that would also mean that um, wealthy people are more are, are in a better position um, to be saved. And if you go to look at the scriptures, uh, that that's not true at all. Um, and in fact, if you look at the Gospels, Jesus, if you look at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in the New Testament, Jesus makes it a point to kind of say that he's not necessarily there for the wealthy. Uh, the, he kind of makes the argument that the wealthy are doing all right as it is, uh, that he's there for the poor, for the powerless, for you know the weak, uh, the downtrodden. So I'm kind of sure that the, that the you know the church's practice of you know making sure that rich people can get into heaven isn't exactly what Jesus had in mind. If you go by the Gospels, all right. So then the other thing that, and this is really where the um, I guess the wheels come off um, and it's the final straw for Martin Luther. It's when they begin um, selling indulgences for dead, dead relatives. Um, and and that, that was just too much for Martin Luther. Okay. And so what this slide here shows is kind of how the idea of purgatory is set up. But, uh, you know, so I, I, it talks about the treasury of merit. I, I almost feel like it's too, ridiculous to even discuss so i'm going to skip over that i'll leave that for you to read but uh this this is just how it, it got more and more corrupt and more and more absurd um and so when um johann tetzel starts getting close to luther uh in the university of wittenberg in saxony he's going to interfere with the um prince Prince Frederick the Wise now of Saxony. Now, Prince Frederick the Wise of Saxony will become one of Martin Luther's um, biggest fans and somebody who's very responsible for his faith or his religion uh, surviving. But it's interesting because the same day that Johann Tetzel was going to be in Wittenberg uh, selling these indulgences, it was going to be um, um, November 1st, 1517 so that's called all saints day it's the day after halloween um so the same day that tetzel was going to be in wittenberg uh selling his indulgences was the same day that prince frederick the wise was going to be uh offering a view of um offering to view his 19,000 uh, relic um, display so that was going to interfere. That was going to be competition for Prince Frederick the Wise because the, the indulgences seemed like a better source of grace. It was more assured salvation than just simply viewing some relics. And so Martin Luther, um, you know, did a, uh, a good thing um, for um, Prince Frederick by posting his 95 Theses. And so why does he post the 95 Theses? Luther posts them on the church door, whether he did or not, there was some, you know, uh, debate on whether or not he actually did that. But he does make his criticisms of the church uh, public, and they end up being printed. And most people believe that it's that it wasn't Luther's doing, that somebody else took it to a printing press and then began to disseminate these ideas um, not just in Saxony, but throughout the Holy Roman Empire. And he just didn't want the poor people to be duped, that they were being taken for their money. And he thought that that was very unfortunate, and it made him very angry with the church. So he was trying to prevent people from purchasing, you know, um, their indulgences. Um, But the other way that we want to look at it is also that Luther is a reformer. Okay, so he's trying to, uh, <clears throat> with these 95 Theses, by posting them, he's hoping to bring about some sort of public debate so that this can raise awareness. So think of it in terms of that. He's hoping to raise awareness about some of these reforms and or needed reforms and so that in the end this can reform the church okay so think of it in those terms as well 
Um, <clears throat> so what ends up happening is the sale of indulgences uh, begins to plummet. And this makes uh, the powers that be uh, very angry. So you have the Archbishop of Mainz, who's angry, Johann Tetzel, and then ultimately the Pope. Um, but the, I guess, fortunate for Luther, um, the, homie, <clears throat> the Holy Roman Emperor Maximilian I dies. And so that creates a distraction because there is going to be an election. Um, an election for the next Holy Roman Emperor. Okay, because this is where things are a little bit different. We've talked about kingdoms. We've talked about kings and the, the line of secession. Um, but with an emperor, there's no clear-cut sign uh, or a, a clear-cut um, line of secession, okay? And so what has to happen is the, the candidates must be elected. They must be elected by seven uh, electors. And those electors are the princes of the seven largest principalities within the Holy Roman Emperor, uh, Empire. And so what the candidate has to do is make promises. Uh, and so for Charles, who is, his name is Carlos, or uh, Carlos I, or Charles I of Spain, has to promise that he's not going to violate the rights of these various princes and that they are going to retain some of their autonomy. Okay, and this is key because when Luther gets into trouble, the Holy Roman Emperor, who will become known as Charles V, or as I lovingly refer to him as Chucky V, uh, he's unable to arrest Luther. He's unable to uh, act unilaterally and get rid of uh, Luther. All right, and so it was the election process that he had to give certain protections and rights to the holy or, or to the various seven uh, princes, and one of those elector princes was Frederick the Wise. Okay, so they're all distracted, you know, with the election of a new Holy Roman Emperor. Uh, Luther is sort of forgotten about, at least for a time being. And, you know, make sure we understand down here it says, <clears throat> okay, he, Charles promises to consult with a diet, which was the name of the legislative body in the Holy Roman Empire, on all major domestic and foreign affairs uh, issues that affected the empire. Okay? So if we look at <clears throat> a map, this is the Holy Roman Empire inside, I believe that's red, this sort of, I don't know, I, I don't even know what color that is, it's like a light brown uh, to me, or a tan, I suppose. Uh, all of this represents lands that are directly in the, under direct control by the Holy Roman Emperor, okay? So the, the rest of this territory is sort of semi-autonomous. The best way to describe the Holy Roman Empire is it's a confederacy, okay? That means that they uh, have allegiances to both the Holy Roman Emperor, but also to their home principalities. Not too terribly dissimilar to what we've seen with France. But uh, the other land, because he's the king of Spain, this is also what he uh, controls, as well as uh, Naples in the Italian peninsula. And then if we were to go across the ocean to the New World, he would have... Uh, a lot of land there as well. So he's got uh, a very <clears throat> busy plate, if you will. Okay, and then so here are the um, the areas where Lutheranism is is sort of um, going to become prime. All right, and they're 
we're going to see the the spread of Protestantism in these specific um, principalities. Okay, so Luther is uh, encouraged to attend uh, a debate. Uh, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but uh, Luther challenges the infallibility of the Pope, and what that means is that when it comes to doctrinal issues, the Pope is incapable of making mistakes because he is known as the, the vicar of Christ that when it comes to matters of doctrine or matters of scriptures, whatever the, whatever the Pope says is final, okay? And so he disagrees with that just simply because he's a man, all right? And, and people are flawed. And so he shouldn't have ultimate authority, okay? And so this is where Luther then says uh, that the ultimate authority is the Bible, is the scriptures. And so we must, you know, refer to the scriptures to make those uh, decisions for us. Okay, um, there's some other things that he talks about in his writings as well on the Babylonian captivity of the church. He attacks the traditional seven sacraments, okay, and so they are in order, uh, like in order of like throughout your life when you might receive the baptism at birth, obviously. Uh, you receive uh, reconciliation or going to confession, that's the second one. Uh, Eucharist or communion, that's the third. Uh, to become an adult in the church, it's called um, confirmation. If you want to be uh, ordained, become a member of the clergy, um, you, you do what's called, you receive the sacrament of holy orders. Uh, the sacrament of marriage is very important. Um, we'll talk about that because um, within the Catholic Church, divorce is not uh, possible, all right, because it is a religious symbol and you become one. And so it, when you get married, it's impossible to, uh, to break that apart. Uh, the other one is uh, anointing of the sick. So that, that's the seventh one, anointing of the sick. And so if um, you have the opportunity in your life to receive all of those sacraments, the church says then you are receiving God's grace each and every time you receive a sacrament. And so Luther says, well, if we're going to refer to scriptures, there's only two instances or two examples of sacraments in the Bible, and that is baptism. Jesus himself was, was baptized by John the Baptist, his uh, second cousin, and then the Eucharist because of the uh, Last Supper. But other than that, he says the other five do have no place within um, church practices. So when he does that, he is really challenging um, a, a lot. I mean, he is digging himself a grave that it's going to be difficult for him to get himself out of, okay? And so the attacking of the communion, we've already discussed this. He says that this is just um, not something that the priest has the power to do because the priest, he believes in a priesthood of all believers. We're all equal in, eyes, God, in God's eyes. And so therefore, a priest can't perform that miracle, okay? God performs miracles. Mankind, humans do not perform miracles, okay? So the theory or the belief that the Catholic Church has that the priest performs a miracle is called transubstantiation. Now, Luther doesn't believe in transubstantiation. This is what Luther believes. He believes in something called consubstantiation. And what that means is that Jesus, God, is everywhere. And Jesus is as much present in the communion wafer and the wine as he is in everything in anything else so he believes that jesus is physically present but he believes jesus is physically present in everything so jesus was physically present in the communion wafer and the wine even before the priest performs the consubstantiation or the uh the miracle and and that's because the priest doesn't perform a miracle at all, okay? And so Jesus is everywhere. And so that is what his belief is, okay? All right. That's important. All right. So Luther is um, uh, ordered to take back in a papal bull called Exerge Domine, which in 1520, so this is just... Um, three, almost three years after he posts 
the 95 Theses on the Church Door of Wittenberg. That was in on October 31st, 1517. So within three years, he's been ordered to recant, to take back everything that he has said with regard to the Pope, with regard to um, indulgences, everything. And he's given 60 days to retract, and if not, he would receive a final, a papal bull of uh, excommunication. And excommunication is a big deal, because if you are excommunicated from the church, you cannot receive the sacraments. And if you can't receive the sacraments, you can't receive God's grace, and therefore you are condemned. Your soul is condemned. You will not enter heaven, and in fact, you will go to hell. All right, so what Luther does is he takes that document and he throws it in the fire. And he gives it like a public demonstration and everybody knows this has just gotten real. Okay, so <clears throat> the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V wants to have Luther arrested, but he knows that he can't. He can't act unilaterally because of what he had to agree when he was elected. So he holds an official diet and um, it's called the Diet of Worms because that's the name of the city where the diet met. And uh, many of the princes and um, uh, other, official, um, or other officials are in attendance. Okay, And Luther is here along with the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V. And it's here that he is ordered to recant, to take back what he has said. Um, Luther sort of thinks that he has the opportunity to debate. Uh, he says he's willing. He's willing to take back what he said. He's willing to recant. If someone can prove to him um, in, in scriptures where he's in error. And uh, he says, if you can't, then I can't. If you can't prove to me where I'm wrong, I can't recant. Take back what I said. All right. So he is allowed uh, to leave. Okay. And after the meeting is um, adjourned, that eat, you know the uh, diet is uh, adjourned. The Holy Roman Emperor Charles V issues the Edict of Worms, and this is big because Luther is now declared an outlaw and a heretic. His books are ordered to be burned. All of his followers are ordered to be arrested. And it's this at this moment where uh, Prince Frederick the Wise acts, and that's him, uh, you know, in this drawing here. And he sort of kidnaps Luther and takes him to one of his more remote uh, castles and lets Luther sort of hide out there until... Uh, things blow over. And while Luther is there, he translates uh, the New Testament from Erasmus's uh, translation of the Catholic Vulgate from uh, when, when Erasmus did that from Greek to Latin. And so what Luther does is he translates it from Latin to German. And, and this is very important as well, because what does Luther want? He wants people to read the scriptures for, for themselves. Uh, he believes that it is a simple enough message that all can understand. All right. So, you know, so since Luther has come up with this concept known as the priesthood of all believers, he's sort of in a bit of a pickle because he doesn't have uh, a, a church infrastructure. Okay, like a physical infrastructure, people to help organize his church. And so he is going to become very uh, reliant and dependent upon the princes. So in those principalities throughout the Holy Roman Empire that have, uh, you know, where Luther has a following, uh, he's going to need those princes to help organize his church. Um, and just so we're clear, there's quite a few of the princes who are very interested in becoming one of you know Luther's followers because that means the money, uh, the tithing, no longer goes down to Rome. It'll stay. It'll stay local. So that's sort of a 
a motivating factor. All right. Um, and so we'll get into that because there is a moment when the support of the princes is in question. And if he doesn't maintain that support, then his church disappears. Um, okay. So what, you know, one of the big things that a priest has to take is a vow of, uh, celibacy. And that means, uh, no sex. Okay. Uh, celibacy, uh, I often joke means in Latin, no sexy timus, but it's just me being silly. It, 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 um, is an important vow. Luther decides to marry a woman, okay, and he decides to marry uh, an ex-nun, uh, Katerina von Bora, okay. So we want to talk a little bit about marriage, um, and and Luther, you know, really focuses on the importance of marriage as a important building block of Christian society. All right, and if we're going to build God's kingdom here on earth, on earth, we have to do that through uh, loving, God-fearing families. And you know, so Luther writes extensively about the importance of marriage, and that marriage, um, contrary to what you know, the Catholic Church, the Catholic Church believes that holy orders uh, being ordained. Is more, you know, is, is is more spiritually valuable than getting married. Luther says that that is, um, you know, what we're all called to do. We are all called to get married, um, and it's important because we're as humans, uh, you know, we're born with a lot of urges, and those include sexual, sexual urges, and so therefore, um, an antidote to that lust that humans feel uh, is marriage. Uh, so, you know, Luther talks about sexual urges and things like that being sort of normal. Uh, the Catholic Church says that that is a sign of evil and that lust is the devil. Um, and Luther doesn't make that same claim. He just says that it's normal. Um, it's normal for people to be lustful. So the best way to deal with that lust is to get married so that you can have, you know, have have sex and, you know, have children and things like that. But it's, um, so, the, you know, marriage becomes sort of uh, the hallmark of Lutheranism. And that also means that the woman uh, has a very important role uh, within the marriage, you know, within the family. She is supposed to help um, teach the children about religion and this means that women german women because this is where you know uh, luther lives in the holy roman empire they deserve or they should be educated they should be educated they should know how to read and write so that um, they can do a better job of instructing their children on the importances of scriptures okay uh, and when we talk about the priesthood of all believers that is this idea that we're all equal under the eyes of God, and so that women are the same as man uh, under the or in the eyes of God. However, in the family, uh, a woman uh, is still sort of um, beneath the man. Okay, she is subordinate to the man as far as importance goes, and that the man has a right, if necessary, to coerce his wife into godly behaviors. So if the if the wife is sinful, then he has a right to coerce her. That doesn't mean that he has a right to abuse her, but physically make her better. So this is important because when we talk about the role of women uh, throughout this course. So um, what else do I want to say? Okay, so yeah, a wife is taught to be obedient to the man, uh, but that also Marriage is seen differently. It's not a sacrament. So there is at least an opening, even though it was one that was uh, not popular. Uh, in fact, there was, you know, a big um, 
you know, that would be considered a big scandal if somebody were to get a divorce. But this, this opens the door to getting a divorce. Within Protestantism, because it is not a sacrament, a woman has an opportunity to divorce her husband, just like a man does. In, in Catholic society, that is not to happen. But within Protestantism, it is. But it's going to be very, very rare. Okay? Um, what else do I need to say? Oh, okay. So the other thing that we want to talk about with women, I mean, although it seems like for as far as an education goes, this is good for women. If they're in a horrible marriage, this is good for women. Um, but when we talk about a religious vocation, women are not they lose they lose with protestantism they lose out because within catholicism they have an outlet for their uh, religious vocation so if they believe they have a religious calling to serve god within the catholic church they can become a nun they can they can be ordained a nun but they can't within um protestantism in fact Protestantism de-emphasizes Mary, uh, the importance of Mary. Within Catholicism, she is very important to all, but she also serves as an inspiration and a role model to women, as do all of the female saints. Well, there are no saints. Within Protestantism, there is no focus on saints or the lives of saints. Uh, that's one of the uh, criticisms that uh, Protestants have of Catholics is that they pray to the saints and they don't like that because they view that as sort of like taking false gods like you're praying to idols idol worship but the Catholic Church would say no no that's not it at all what we are doing is you know we're, we're praying to the saints so that they would intercede with God on our behalf so it us you know uh, one way of looking at it would be like if you ask somebody to pray for you, if you ask somebody to pray for you, that would be the same as it, in many ways the Catholic Church saying, if you pray to a saint, you're asking the saint to sort of pray for you, to intercede on your behalf. But anyway, there is none of that, all right? There's no saints, there's no definitely no female saints, and they de-emphasize the importance of Mary because within Catholicism, Mary is very important. So no nuns, no religious vocations, and, and no uh, female... Uh, role models, religious role models. Okay, so that's lost. That's lost, and that's what these uh, these notes talk about. All right, so they get rid of convents, and that's where um, you know nuns lived, and lived in a, a commune or you know community of other nuns. So there's that. Okay, so this is where Luther's um, support from the princes gets challenged. And that's the peasants' revolt uh, in the mid 1520s. Okay, so in the early 1520s, uh, there were a series of crop failures that led to some famine and to some suffering, and so the hardships on the peasants was very high, was very great, and it was during this time that the secular princes, the rulers, began to suggest that you know, in order to compensate themselves for the loss revenues because of the crop failures that they needed to up the taxes and up the requirements of the peasants to turn over crops or money or what have you and so that additional hardship was almost too much to bear for these people that it was breaking them financially and causing much um, suffering and so luther sides with the uh, peasants and and they articulate their demands against the princes in what's known as the 12 articles and this is where the message of luther gets confused because luther initially is very supportive of the peasants against the princes and he even vocalizes that or, and he even writes about that and he calls on the princes to to take away the taxes and he criticizes them for doing that. So that support of the princes and then Luther's message about freedom and religious freedom is misunderstood to talk about political freedom. And as a result of that, 
they begin to rebel violently, okay? And so that means they're committing acts of violence against their princes and killing their families in certain instances. And so Luther, Luther's response is very swift, and he calls and he pens um, a pamphlet known as Against the Murderous Thieving Hordes of the Peasants, and he calls on them to cut them down without mercy. Um, and why does he do this? Okay, there's two reasons. There's two reasons. The first reason is because um, Luther is a strong believer in scriptures. And in scriptures, it talks about the importance of having a secular state and that the secular state provides a very important function, and that is it provides stability. It provides order. And that is something that power, that to do that, that sovereignty is granted to the secular state from God. And there is scriptural support for that. Um, and so Luther is very much against people taking those sort of violent actions. Luther, from a religious standpoint, is sort of seen as a radical. But when it comes to politics and things like that, he's very conservative. He is not against any kind of rebellion whatsoever. Um, you know, basically his thinking is this. If you live under a tyrant for a king or a leader, then so be it. That's, that's the cross that you have to bear. Um, and, and there's nothing really that you can do about it. You just have to deal with it. Um, and then, you know, God will, will sort that out. So, uh, when they take actions, he says, strike them down. The other, uh, probably as important, if not more important reason, uh, that he comes out against that is because he needs the support of the princes. So if he comes out in support of the peasants or is just silent, then the princes are going to interpret that as uh, he's not supporting them. And if he's not going to support them, he, they're not going to support him with his church. And so for his church to survive, he has to take action. And so the result, though, unfortunately, of writing this um, document is the result 70 to 100, 70,000 to 100,000 peasants are slayed. So this is a butchery. And so this is something that Luther has to deal with. Um, you know, it's sort of, he ha sort of has blood on his hands. Um, and that is something that he, you know, is upset and saddened deeply by, but um, it's something that, you know, he sticks to, but that makes him controversial for sure uh, because of that. Um, <clears throat> so what we start to see is, um, and what this map shows is the spread of Protestantism. So when we look at it, we look at, again, what this map shows is the spread of Protestantism throughout Europe. Um, so it, it also shows that Catholicism maintains very uh, uh, the dominant religion majority re religion in France, Spain, and Italy. So Protestantism really doesn't hit there. Um, it, and so the Holy Roman Empire here in Central Europe becomes mostly Lutheran. Um, we're going to look and look over to England, and that is going to become what's known as the Anglican Church. Um, Ireland will remain Catholic, and then Scotland and the Netherlands, and then parts of Sweden will become Calvinist. Um, and, but actually Scotland is what is known as Presbyterian, which is a form of Calvinism. And that's based off of the teachings of John Calvin. Um, good parts of, uh, Eastern Europe will either remain Catholic or they are also a different, there is a different, um, branch of Christianity and it's known as the Eastern Orthodox, Eastern Orthodox or the Greek Orthodox religion. But anyway, just so you can see, um, that that's the deal. Okay. So <clears throat> getting back to Charles V. Now, Charles V is, uh, an opponent of Luther's simply because Luther is creating religious division and religious division is something that, that nobody has really much experience with. 
Um, we've seen some religious division inside of Spain. That's, you know, the great grandparents of um, Charles V. And the way they dealt with it was, you know, to root it out, to maintain religious um, unity. And the idea, the thinking is that with religious unity, there is political unity. Where there is religious division, there will soon be political division. And that's upright, you know, that's rebellion. And that's something that's not tolerable. So he, he views... Luther, although Luther is very much a political conservative, Charles V doesn't get that. He he just doesn't like the fact that there is religious division. And and so, you know, he wants to deal with that, but he can't, okay? And the reason why he can't is because of foreign affair issues. He's got two things that he has to deal with. One is a war with France. That's the habsburg valois Wars. Uh, so he needs the support of all of his princes. And so he really doesn't do much after the Edict of Worms to stamp out Lutheranism. And, and again, that's because he needs the support of the Lutheran princes to fight not just the habsburg valois War, uh, but also the... Um, taken on the Ottoman. Okay, so if we look at this map and you look at Eastern um, Europe here, this has all been taken by the Ottoman Empire. All right, so Constantinople was right here. That was the last vestige of the Byzantine Empire that fell in 1453. So by 1529, you have the Ottomans uh, laying siege to Vienna. Okay. And this is all right during the time period of Martin Luther and the rise of Lutheranism. So he needs, he's got bigger fish to fry than Luther. So he is going to remain silent until these two foes are de dealt with. So we have France on the Western front, if you will, and the Ottoman on the Eastern front. Okay, so that is going to keep um, Charles quiet but then in 1530 he feels as if he's got these problems uh in hand mostly and so he calls another diet this is known as the diet of augsburg and he orders all lutheran princes to return to catholicism to revert to catholicism and they refuse and instead form the schmalkaldic league which was an alliance system uh, to protect them against Luther or against Charles V, uh, and so the Schmalkaldic League is formed, and then there's ultimately wars, 1546 to 1547. They are able to uh, defeat, or at least put up enough of a good showing the Lutherans, because they have the support of the French. The French are supporting. Uh, the Lutherans, even though the French are Catholic, they're not supporting Charles because Charles was a, a foe of theirs, but also because this will keep the Holy Roman Empire weakened or it will keep them divided. And a big fear, if uh, we were to go back, is for the French, a big fear is a united Germany. Look at how big the Holy Roman Empire would be if it was united politically, but it's not. It's divided. It's a confederacy. All of these princes have their own, you know, they have sovereignty, they have autonomy. And so the French support the Lutherans simply because they want to keep um, the Holy Roman Empire divided. Hopefully that makes sense. Uh, and then in 1555, the Peace of Augsburg is signed. And what that does is, um, you know, sort of puts everything to rest. All right. And so that means there's no more fighting. Okay. There's no more fighting. There's, uh, but it doesn't, it, it doesn't provide religious tolerance. Um, oftentimes people look at the Peace of Augsburg and they think that, that it, that's what it gives Europe. It gives the first expression of religious tolerance. And it really doesn't. Um, it's whatever the prince, the German prince's religion is, then that's going to be the religion of a subject. So, it, and the choices 
either or. It's either Catholicism or Lutheranism. So if the German prince is Lutheran, all of his subjects have to be Lutheran and vice versa. If they don't like that, then they have to move. That's it. I mean, there's not going to be any Catholics in Lutheran lands or vice versa. So what does that do? Well, it, it means this is the first time that there's religious d division, you know, and it's that they've sort of dealt with it the best way. It's a live and let live type of mentality, uh, atmosphere, but it isn't um, religious tolerance. But what this is going to do is this is going to open the door for other religions and the conflicts are going to be revisited and there's going to be terrible bloodshed. There's going to be terrible wars of religion, um, not not just in the Holy Roman Empire. There's going to be one. It's called it's going to be called the Thirty Years' War, and that's going to be the most destructive. And that'll be 1618 to 1648. But then in the late 16th century, the like 1560s to the 1590s, we we're going to have the French Wars of Religion too. Same deal. All right. So it's going to rip Europe apart. So there's tremendous division, bloodshed that's on the horizon. So that is sort of the historical significance of Luther. I mean, he doesn't, you know, do this willingly, uh, but that's an, you know, that is an unforeseen uh, consequence of his actions. Okay, so we'll go ahead and wrap it up here.